Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California, and we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also, here is Mark Ellis. Hey, you know what? Sometimes, kids, you can't help it. Chic just happens. <laughs> <laughs> also, here, very number off. Hi, guys. I am so excited for today's episode. There's no sidebar. I won't spoil the surprise, but this is my kind of episode today. Also, here, Christian Harloff. I told her I wouldn't do it, but I have to, and I'm sorry for everybody out there. Perry is engaged. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Right. So, oh, well, Perry. congratulations, Perry. And, and all of a sudden, Perry my lives. mom just got really disturbed and confused. <laughs> and you're pregnant. So, oh, oh, there we go. Congratulations. We're just spreading all the great rumors well, today. Well, now we now, know why you're we? engaged. <laughs> um, hey, guys, I just wanted to remind you a little something we announced yesterday. So, obviously, the, the crew here, we were at Star Wars Celebration, and when they premiered the last. Last Jedi trailer for the first time. They gave out a limited number of these actual posters. This poster is actually from that screening in Orlando, Florida at Star Wars Celebration of the Last Jedi trailer. So we have that and we have the autographs down here on the bottom of all the major, uh, like all the big collider video. All your favorites are on here. Of course, we got Jeremy Johns' signature there. We got Christian Harloff's, there's Perry's. We got everybody's autographs. Oh, is Mark here. Ellis on there? No. You listen um, to everybody else. Might as well throw my name in oh, there, Mark too. Oh, Mark Ellis is there. Might as well mention that. I don't too. know how you is sneak that, that on there. I specifically right. said he didn't, I didn't want it there. Oh. But anyway. Uh, now, we want to give this poster away to one of you guys. So how can you get your hands on this? Just do this. Jump onto YouTube and make a 10 second video about why you love Collider Video. And then email us at collidervideo at gmail.com and send us the link to your YouTube video. We're going to go through them all. We're going to pick one at random and send one lucky person this poster. So go on and send in your stuff. Now, today's movie talk is a special one. I've been getting a lot of, speaking of collidervideo at gmail.com, been getting a lot of emails lately asking about what we're predicting for the box office for the summer. Will this movie beat this movie? What will be the big winners in the box office this summer? And so we thought, you know what? So many people are asking about this. Let's just have an episode where we talk about the big summer blockbusters and what we think are going to end up being the top five box office winners. Now, we're not necessarily talking about what we think are going to be the best five movies of the summer. We're talking about what are the movies that we think the audience has the most appeal for? What do we think ones are putting together the best marketing campaigns? How is this all going to result in the box office totals? That's what we're going to discuss today. So we've got a whole bunch of movies listed here. We're going to go through a bunch of them. We're going to discuss and debate a little bit how we think they're going to do box office-wise. Then at the end, each one of us are going to give you what we think is going to be the top five results of the box office domestically this summer, and then we want to see how it compares to your guys' list. Let us know. Jump into the comments section once we get through all the movies here and let us know what you think. The top five results are going to be the, block, the blockbusters of 2017 summer. All right. So let's get started with a couple of films that are already in theater. So a little, bit of <laughs> <No>? <laughs> a little bit of cheating here, but we're going to start with Guardians of the Galaxy. Guardians of the Galaxy already out in theaters, already domestically made about $168 million in just a couple of weeks. Uh, I mean, worldwide, it's almost at $500 million already, but it's motoring along. So, Mark, let me start with you. You think this Guardians is going to end up in the top five? I think it's going to be a contender, John. I think you can never count out a movie that has a young Kurt Russell, and it looks so realistic. <laughs> it looks like him. I think that it's. I think it's going to be a contender for possibly a top three spot. I mean, oh, look, wow. anytime a movie kicks off the summer, first of all, it has that. It has that luxury of being the movie that everybody gets excited about. So people pay money to see that. Then they start budgeting out the rest of their summers. So I like a movie's odds if it opens earlier in the summer. Math is cheating. This the, guy was doing a little math two minutes no, before we started. No, I wasn't. All right. I, I don't think Guardians has a shot at being uh, number one. I do think it will make it into the top five, though. It's hard to argue against an MCU film in the summer, something like that. It'll be the top five, but it's not going to end up as my number mm. one. Yeah, I don't think it has a chance at number one, but I think that uh, it'll be a lock for top five, for sure, and I'd say maybe even in top three. But uh, it's, the thing is, early May definitely helps its chances for being in the top three, but the oh, the new Guy Ritchie film, King Arthur, Legend of the Sword... 
Um, in the words of the great Vincent McMahon, no chance in hell. Uh, I enjoyed this movie. It's actually getting brutalized by the critics right now. Actually, yesterday on Movie Talk, we noticed it had a 5% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's gone north of 20, so it has gone up. Actually, can you look up? What's it at right I, now? I have it at 23 right now. Okay, so it's gone up even more since the last time hey. I checked. So it's all the way up to 23. Uh. This is one of the situations where I disagree with the majority of the critics. I actually enjoy this film, but th this does not have the broad appeal. This does not. This is going to do fine. It's going to do okay at the box. I don't see any way this gets in the top five. This movie needed good word of mouth to make it into the top fifteen of it's the not year, getting it. and it's not getting good word of mouth because I th I think there are a lot of other movies on this list that people who don't get the privilege of actually going to go and see these movies like. The week, two weeks before they come out, they have to choose what they're going to see and what they're going to spend their hard-earned money on. And I don't think Arthur is going to be it. So I don't, I don't see it hitting top five at all. Mark. John, I think the Black Knight from Monty Python and the Holy Grail has a better shot of defeating King <laughs> Arthur than King Arthur Wedge of the Sword does as being at the top five in the box office. It's a, I had a great time watching this movie. I think it's a good flick. I just don't think, even if it was getting great word of mouth, it's just not that type of movie that's going to get into the top five domestically. Fair. It does not have a chance, and I'm so sad because not only is it not going to make any money, and it costs a ton of money to make, but it's it's got such a low score, and I don't think I don't think it deserves yeah, that. Neither. Clearly, that score reflects everyone and not just my personal opinion but there's there's really nothing that wrong with the movie it's it's hard to hate on anything that i saw in that so i think it deserves a little more credit than it's getting but that's not going to change its box office results all right let's move on to the next one then and that is uh one a lot of people are very curious about which is alien covenant again another film that we had the advantage that we've already seen uh, I'm going to say, again, no chance. No chance because it's in the top five. It's just a little bit too long in the tooth as far as the series goes. I don't think Prometheus did it any favors as far as having you know that broad appeal that got everybody in the movie going audience excited about it. I think it's going to do all right because this is a good movie. I like Alien Covenant quite a bit, a lot more than I thought I would, especially since I really hated on Prometheus. I think it's a good, fun, entertaining movie. I think it's going to have some legs. Top five, no chance. Top five, definitely not. But I think it's going to do okay. Again, Prometheus did not do it any favors, but I think the promotional campaign and the approach that they're taking to marketing, marketing this will help it because they've been highlighting the alien and aliens aspects of it much more so than they are yes. doing the Prometheus one. So it's not going to be the top five overall, but I think if it starts with something like 45 million, it'll be in good shape. Mark? Uh, you know, the Xenomorph has a lot of mouths to feed, John. <laughs> and with all of the... That was funny on several levels. Th well, thank you for laughing. I guess everybody else took the laugh off. <laughs> That, was, that actually felt pretty good. That felt genuine. <laughs> um, I think that this movie is going to do well because of the positive word of mouth. So unlike a King Arthur situation where you look at the Rotten Tomatoes, people start backpedaling. I've heard mostly positive things about Alien Covenant. I haven't checked out myself yet, disappointingly. But I'm looking forward to it. I think a lot of people are. I think it has a good opening weekend. Around that 40, 45 million is something I think they'd be thrilled with. That is not enough to get into the top five. No chance in hell. Um, I think that it's going to do very well, but no, not top five. And I think even if this movie was perfect, and I enjoyed watching it, but if this movie was perfect, it still wouldn't be in the top five, I think, because there's a specific audience. It is, like you said, it's not for the mass audience. It's not like it's it, it just it's not family friendly. It doesn't have that kind of mass appeal, like you were saying, too. And I think it'll do very well, what they wanted to. I don't think this movie was ever intended to be the, the top five earner type of movie. So... It will do well. It just won't be in the I think top the big five. problem with Alien Covenant 2 is that the movie coming out the weekend after is really going to affect everybody else's box office. Yeah, I agree. Well, I mean, that's true as well. But I will say this. The next Alien film, I think, will have a shot at a top five summer thing because the momentum that I believe that this movie is going to get. And because they're going to be fighting Predators? And because they're going to be fighting, yes, many, many. Please never do that again. <laughs> All right. The next uh, movie up here on the block, we got Pirates of the Caribbean, Te Dead Men, Tell No Tales, opening on May 26th. Perry, let's start with you. Any chance this gets in the top five? If we were talking about opening weekend numbers, I would say yes, but we're not. We're talking about the domestic haul overall, and I'm actually going to say no. I think it's going to miss the mark because, as we know with all Pirates movies, there's a big divide between the domestic and the international. This, mo this movie is going to make its money overseas, not here. I don't think it has a chance. Once again, Perry, you're drinking has affected your performance on the show because I think Pirates has every chance of being in the top five. I'm not guaranteeing it yet. It's 
on the cusp, but I think that Pirates, because of what these trailers have done, I think that this, taking a little bit of a break from On Stranger Tides, throwing Ghost Sharks into the mix, throwing Javier Bardem into the mix, having a lot of classic characters come back for this one, I think this could have legs week to week to week, which is what you need to be in the top five during the summertime. And once again, your math skills and obsession with sharks has affected <laughs> yours. Yeah, I'm with Perry on this one. I don't think it has a chance at the top five. I think because it's a flailing uh, franchise, I think they are trying to, to right the ship, if you will. Um, and I think that ah. the, what, you've, what you've seen <laughs> so far... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What you've seen so far in the trailers are people getting... And, and the fact that they're showing footage early. and I think they have confidence in the movie, but I think Pirate 6, if this movie is good, has a better chance of being in the top five because people's confidence right now is shook by the Pirates. And I think that there are other movies that we haven't talked about yet that are just are more anticipated than this film and movies that are coming out the following week that could hurt its box office, so I don't think so. Uh, I'm going to differ from you guys. I think this thing has a shot at the top five. I really, really do. Because, look, this thing has been, like, regardless of what you think about the movies individually, this is a... The people love this franchise. How did the fourth one do uh, overall? Two, it did $241 million overall. domestically. Domestically. Uh, overall, it cracked a billion dollars. Okay. Um, I, and I think the And I think it good reviews. That, that, that one did not get great no, no, reviews. Better than a third, I think, right? So it, 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, but but the, see, th th that one on Stranger Tides had to lift the weight of the really boring conclusion of the first trilogy. Right. So this one isn't doesn't have it doesn't feel like this one has all those chains attached to it. So like what John says, I think that this one with positive word of mouth can go week to week, even though it's got to go up against Wonder Woman in its second weekend. And I think a big factor here is that I have actually been fairly impressed with the marketing campaign. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to go a long way. So I actually do think this one's going to have a shot. It just might be on my list when we get to the end here. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on to uh, one of the more highly anticipated ones this summer, of course, coming out on June 2nd. It's so close now. Wonder Woman, uh, the fourth offering from the brand new DCEU, is coming out. Christian, let's start with you. How, does this one get in the top five? No, it doesn't. I, I think it's it's got. I don't really think it has a chance to be in the top five because I think for one, it's tracking not well. Um, the other the other reason why is I think people have DC weariness right now. I think that even if you look at what whether, whatever Suicide Squad did, I know Batman v Superman did pretty well overall um, but I don't think I think Wonder Woman is definitely anticipated I think people want to see I certainly want to see it but I don't think it's going to hit top five at all I actually think it has a shot at top three I think this one has a shot at top three. Right, the, the one thing that is a little concerning, you're right, it's not tracking great right now. But because of my belief that I do think that this is going to be a better movie than most people are anticipating, I think it'll have some really good solid word of mouth behind it. I think a lot of people want to see a Wonder Woman movie. So I'm going to say yes, it's going to be in the top five. I'm going to say it is definitely going to be in the top five. And I don't think the tracking is an issue because the tracking headline that everyone keeps saying is this is going to be the DCEU's lowest earner, which might be true, but it's still going to make a ton of money. I think the last tracking report I saw, or or more so, not not even tracking, but someone's box office predictions was something like 90. Yeah, that's, I, a, that's a big opening weekend. Absolutely, but is it top five? I'm, I don't think, I, I, I'm I not think saying it's going to bomb. It's going to do well. Because I just think only 90 makes the, it top five. So right now in the DCEU, the lowest earner in terms of overall domestic growth is Man of Steel with 291. I have a good feeling that just because of the the interest in Wonder Woman, the interest in seeing a female superhero leading a movie with a female director with a whole bunch of people like really waiting and hoping that the DCEU can turn it around, I really think this thing has a good chance of coming close to like 270. Yeah, and by the way, uh, that tracking number, I think it's going to obliterate the tracking number. I think it's opening weekend is going to obliterate that. Anyway, yeah, y'all are adorable for still trusting box office tracking. <laughs> what did Beauty and the Beast teach us? That movie made like 50 more million dollars than what it was tracking at. So I think that this is a, actually a similar situation to Beauty and the Beast because... People who are comic book fans are excited about Wonder Woman. There are so many females on this planet that have been waiting for this movie to come out for such a long time. You're going to have little girls rushing to the theater, dressed as Wonder Woman, finally getting to embrace their favorite superhero on the big screen, headlining her own movie for the first time. I think this crushes all the tracking. I think it definitely has a shot at top five. It's on the cusp of like being four or five for me. All right, we're going to start flying through the next bunch of ones here, but we got coming out June 9th. Everyone's waiting for this mm -hmm. Tom Cruise movie. The Mummy comes out, which I got to tell you, myself, I am far more interested in this film than I was when they first announced this new monster cinematic universe. This was a throwaway idea to me at first, but seeing the marketing, I've been getting excited the direction they're going with it. Um, yeah, this one makes top five. 
I think this one makes top five. I think I'm going to be the only person here who thinks that, but I think this one makes top five. What do you think? Uh, you're definitely the only one so far. I, I think <laughs> this one and Alien Covenant are going to have a fun matchup between horror-based classic premises, but I, I don't think the Mummy has a, has a shot Perry. at top five. I don't think this is a chance. You don't just disagree with me. You're <laughs> laughing at me. <laughs> you saw my reaction when you said that. I, I really... I want this to be good so badly because I really want a great monster cinematic universe to exist over at Universal, but even though it's got Tom Cruise in the lead role, just look at his past credits and look at their opening numbers and then their domestic run. The only thing that I, I think there's only been a small handful of his movies that have opened above 50 million and one of them is Rogue Nation and that's because it's part of a, a very popular franchise. So I don't think this is going to be the one to start super high. I think you're right. You're the only person that's going to choose it. <laughs> uh, because yeah, there's, there's, there's no way. I think that, I, I think it's going to be, do better and I think it's going to be better than most people think and I think it's got a shot to crack top 10 it's got a shot to crack uh, 10, but top five, I just don't see it happening. Oh, I cannot wait for that show when this thing opens at $210 million. <laughs> and I am not predicting it's going to open at $210 million, by the way. Okay, let's move on with the first animated film on this list here. We've got Cars 3 opening on June 16th. If there's any... If there's any Pixar franchise that did not ever deserve franchise or, or sequels, it was Cars. And I like Cars. I, I, I think it's a fine little movie, but they, how do we got three Cars movies before we get an incredible stew is still completely beyond me. Uh, it's going to do well. I don't see it in top five, but I think it's going to do well. I do see it in the top five, and I think that it's the power of the kids' movies. There aren't a lot of them this summer, and I'll tell you right now, just as a parent myself, you want to find movies for your kids to see in the summertime. Why? Because they're off from school. And I think that one of the things uh, Cars has done is get people excited again because Pixar ha is back to form. When Cars 2 had come out, they were starting to take a bit of a hit and they weren't as quality. Now they've, they've Brave jumped. wasn't nope. great. Nope. And they've jumped back on, into quality. And I think and Lester is more involved in this one from what I th Very. think. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I, I do think it's going to hit top five for sure. I think that Pixar is going to be one of the kings of the summer. Okay. Nope. If any animated movie makes it into the top five this summer, it's not going to be this one. And it, it is as simple as looking at the numbers. Opening for Cars 1 was $60 million. Opening for Cars 2 was 66 But then when you look at the, the overall gross domestically, it went from Cars 1 had 244 and then it dropped to 191 So even though I think this thing could have a solid opening weekend, I don't think it's going to have the legs, especially with a certain something else coming right up after it. John, she took the one number that I knew. I knew that Cars <laughs> 2 made $191 million domestically, but I also know this. All over America, people have an appetite to see a Larry the Cable Guy headline movie again. I I thought it was going to be Health Inspector 2. No, it's Cars 3, and kids want to see that guy. He's funny, okay? He's funny in the Cars movie. He's funny in Cars 2, and he's going to be funny in this one. And I don't think it quite gets the top five, though. I don't think it quite gets the top five, but you never count out an animated movie. All right, Smurfs. We move on now to <laughs> another animated film opening just two weeks later in a very successful franchise, surprisingly successful franchise, which has been Despicable Me with Despicable Me Three. So, Perry, does this one get in the top five? This this is the one that I think it does have a chance. I think it's going to be towards the bottom of the top five if it gets in there. But th yet again, this is another one that has had a track record that proves that people are still super into this. Even though Minions, I think, was the weakest movie overall of this little franchise they've created... That still made a lot of money, but then again, you can still do the thing where you can where you can compare the opening weekend haul to the final domestic total, and that part dips compared to the opening. So that's the problem of releasing a movie like this in the summer when it's got a whole bunch of things coming after it that's going to take the attention away. But I still think this franchise is alive and thriving. Yeah, I mean, if you want to look, you look, Cars 2 made 191 overall domestic. The last Despicable Me film, Despicable Me 2, made $368 million in the back. Now, if you want to include Minions in that, Minions made $336 million. Uh, at the box office, although that one wasn't actually all that good. I think this one has a definite shot in the top five. Top three. I really? Mean, I, yeah. Top, yeah, I think it is. Because I think that what Minions did poorly was the fact that they put the Minions in the whole movie grew is a big part of what makes these movies special. And I think that the, the thing that he's got and what Steve Carell brings to it, Steve Carell he does bring people into the theater, not not just. I mean, Despicable Me one and two had did did enough that it's kind of built this franchise, and I think people do want to see it. I think Minions could have hurt it a little bit too, and I think that the fact that it comes out right around Cars, I think they're going to be fighting for 
audience members, but I do think that they are going to um, crack top three. Mark? I'd like to use my pronunciation skills to say I want to see a biopic on Minions and <laughs> Despicable Me 3. May not be it, but I think that's the one that's going to edge out Cars 3. If there's going to be one animated movie in the top five, I like Despicable Me 3. Even though Cars 3 has a lot of toy marketing potential, they might crush it more with merchandising sales. As far as people actually seeing the movie, I think Despicable Me 3 has the edge. All right, we move on to one coming out on June 21st, which is a little unknown franchise that goes by the name of Transformers. The next Whee! Transformers film, of course, opens up here. Mark, does it get into the top five? To quote Anthony Hopkins, dude, this thing is going to be in the top five. There's no question about it. I don't care what you guys are saying at home. Transformers 5 is going to be in the top five, and it may be the top movie to come out this summer. Not critically. Not critically at all. Probably not even top 20 critically, but it's going to make a boatload of cash. Perry? I think it's going to be in the top five as well, but it is not a lock because it has the same exact problem that Pirates has, or at least in this game that we're playing right now, because Pirates and Transformers makes its money overseas. It doesn't make it domestically, and I think that the numbers every single year have proved that interest is declining and people are hopefully catching on that these movies suck. Not to say that I don't want it to be good, but I don't think people have hopes in this here, at least. Yeah, if we look at 2009, Revenge of the Fallen made $402 million domestically. Woo. In 2011, Dark Side of the Moon made $352 million domestically. In 2014, Transformers Age of Extinction made $245 domestically. The trajectory is this. This, but I still think it is going to probably be in the top five. It's going to be in the top five, um, and I think that the, I think overall worldwide it's going mm -hmm. to be in the top three. Um, but I probably. think it'll probably just crack the top five for sure. I think that people it is declining a little bit too, but I think there has been a little bit more that this is a freak thing because it gets you every year. Didn't get you this year, but normally it gets you where these trailers. I like, get this is going to be the good one. Everybody says that, and, and they get everyone into the damn theaters because, let's face it, Optimus Prime is cool. It's fun to watch him yes, fight, he is. and you're rooting for him to, come on, make a good movie. You can do it, and he never does it, but you always want to see him do it, and I think people are going to spend the money to try to see him do it, and it'll crack the top five. All right, we now move on to one that's uh, another highly anticipated one. Spider-Man Homecoming opens on July 7th. Christian Harloff, does this first entry of the new standalone Spider-Man franchise get in the top five? Very much so. I think it is a top three, absolutely. I think that the risk that it runs is that the standard moviegoer that is not very familiar with the whole, well, Marvel took it over and this happened, that they're going to just say, oh, this is another one of those Spider-Man movies that just the last one was terrible and they'll associate it with it. That could hurt it. But then there are the, then there's the audience of the many many people that saw Civil War that made Civil War one of the top getters that realized that this kid is is the goods and he is going to be the brand new Spider Man and the fact that they're putting Iron Man in that trailer yeah it's got a shot to be more than just the top three Mark every time I go to Vegas I play my favorite card game Uno this is number <laughs> one this is going to be away. a movie that wins the summer I had that on my list too but huh. I didn't know we were giving away our number one thanks Harry? I'm going to play this game the way I play oh, Uno right. Christian right. Uno draw four God. I was afraid that like my excitement for this movie had me bumping it up a little too high I think this this is going to crush it though because clearly the fact that we keep bringing Spider-Man back is for a reason because people love this character and the way that they've been doing the promos for this is wide appeal. I mean, coming of age paired with superhero, it's a magic mix. And the fact that they introduced him in Civil War was one of the smartest things ever because that movie crushed it. And I think it's definitely going to give this a good chance to be one of the highest earners of the summer. All right, now let's move on. You? Uh, oh, you want to hear what I think? I'd like to hear that. I'm going to yeah. save hey. that for a little later. Aww. Uh -oh. It's going to be in the top piece. five. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, we move on to uh, another little franchise known as War for the Planet of the Apes on opening horses. on June 14th. A lot of excitement about this one. Critically, no doubt, this is probably going to be one of the best movies of the summer. But Mark Ellis will be one of the highest earners of the summer. Yeah, John, there's only one way you can make this movie better if it's apes riding sharks. Now, I'll take apes on horses all day long. That's shot looks amazing. The trailers are amazing. It could be the close to one of the great trilogies we've ever had. I don't know if I can get it in the top five. I think it's going to make a, a crap load of cash. I think critically it might be the best movie this summer. It's on the cusp of making the top five. I think it's a top ten for sure. 
Hard for me to get into that top five spot, though. Perry. No top five for me on this one, but I think it's going to do something that is equally as cool, and that is having a series where they keep making more and more money because Rise had 176 total domestically, then Dawn had 208. I wouldn't be surprised if this one topped that a little. I mean, in a top 10, it's a 100% top 10. I think I'm with Mark. I think it just cracks the top five uh, because, and for exactly what Perry is saying. They're get, the last one was, I loved the first one. The second one was far superior than the first one. And I think the third one, from what we're looking at so far, could be exactly what Mark said, just a closing to a great trilogy. Uh, yeah, I think that we have a good shot here of, of being in the top five. It's tough. I mean, tough. the last one was so great, and it maxed out at 208. So it, it, it is a really, really tough call to get in the top five. I'm a little uncertain. I'm, I'm uncertain it gets mm -hmm. it. It has a shot, but I'm uncertain at this point. All right, we move on now to the next highly anticipated, of course, this time it's coming because of the director, the next Christopher Nolan film, Dunkirk. The war epic opens on July 21st. Perry. How does Dunkirk perform? Does it get into the top five? I think Dunkirk performs well, but not enough to get into the top five. And it's, it seems a little unusual for me to me for a war movie to be coming out in the middle of the summer. I think that does work against it a little, but he's Chris Nolan's like, he's a force of nature. When you put a movie with his name on it out in theaters, it's going to hit a certain point. And it's the, the comparison I was using was uh, looking at Interstellar, which I think had a little more wide appeal. When and did that. That came out in I mean, November, November. Right? November. Okay, yeah. so that that's a different scenario in that respect. But that that opened with forty seven, and then you have Inception, which opened in July right. and made sixty two. But then again, you look at that and you compare to Dunkirk, that had a much more familiar cast. So I don't know. I, I kind of have my fingers crossed for this to open with forty forty five, but it's it's not going to wind up being one of the top grocers. One of my absolute most anticipated films of the summer, and absolutely no chance of getting in the top five. You look at Interstellar; it, ca it capped out at one hundred eighty eight million. I just don't see how this with a less Lesser known cast, a different subject matter that's not sci like the, the marketing of it, sci fi, uh, all that kind of stuff with Interstellar. I don't see it beating that. So, as much as I think it's gonna be one of the best movies of the summer, I don't see it getting the top five. What do you think, Mark? Yeah, I, uh, no top five for this unless Tom Hardy suddenly becomes Bane again and Christopher <laughs> Nolan brings Christian Bale back. I think the movie's gonna be great. No shot at the top five. It's number one if it's the movie that people think could win an Oscar out of all the summer movies. Sure, uh, yes. Because there's no other shot, I think, in there. But I think that there's no chance. I think it'll do very well as far as what they want it to do. But I, this is, again, another movie that they're not expecting it to do these blockbuster movies. Because it's not, by definition, it's not a blockbuster movie. You know, right. It's a summer blockbuster movie. Mm -hmm. All right, and the last film we're going to discuss here today that maybe has a chance, it's, of course, the new one from the Stephen King novel series, The Dark Tower, opening on August 4th. Christian, we finally got a chance to see the first trailer for it. We've seen some interviews and posters. Any chance it gets in the top five? I don't think it has a chance to get into the top five, but what it's doing, it's hitting that money spot in August. That's the, and the money spot is where Guardians came out, the Rise of the Planet of the Apes came out. It is a prime spot for a summer movie to do better than most movies normally do in August. August is just kind of the first week in August is when you could get, this might be your last good chance to see a good movie for the rest of the summer. And I think that's where it will hit. I, I think it'll do really well. Maybe top 10, maybe, but definitely not top five. Perry? No, no, I don't think so. And even though it is in that sweet spot where it could have legs, it still needs to be good. And yeah. I'm a little afraid that if, it, if it's not, not just good, but great, it's not going to make enough going forward. Nah. Yeah, All me right. too. Nah, no chance it gets in there. Thanks for uh, playing. Could be, hopefully it's going to be awesome, but no chance mm -hmm. it gets to the top five. All right, guys. Those are all the films that we thought even maybe had a chance. I mean, there's some other great summer movies coming out. Atomic Blonde, uh, Baby Driver, Lucky Logan, things like that. We just all understand there's no chance those are things are probably even again the top ten box office wise. So now we come down to it. Christian, it's time. We yeah. talked about it. We discussed You heard everything we all had to say. What is going to be the top five box office movies domestically this summer? All right, number five, I've got War of the Planet of the Apes. Just sneak it in there right over Cars, actually. Uh, but I have War of the Planet of the Apes at number five. Number four, I got that stinking Transformers. I think it'll pull <laughs> enough money that it'll hit the top five. I'm gonna, definitely going to be the only person that says this. Number three, I have Despicable Me 3. I think it's going to hit. I think the minions are going to make their triumphant return in the box office. Two, Guardians will 
eke it out and hit the number two spot, followed by Spider-Man at number one. I think that Spider-Man and Tony Stark and the marketing of Tony Tony Stark, the way that they've been doing it, is enough to carry the Marvel uh, wave and get this thing to the top spot. Perry, your top five. All right. For number five, I'm going with Transformers because clearly there's no stopping that franchise, no matter how terrible it is. (laughs) Number number, uh, four, I'm going to give to Wonder Woman. I want to see that do well so badly. I'm actually going to... I switched my list a little as I was thinking about it. I did too. I'm going to put Spider-Man at number three because, I, I again, that's another one that I'm so excited for. I want it to do really well. I'm giving Despicable Me the benefit of the doubt, though, and I'm putting it at number two just because it's got the summer wide open for it after, after it comes out because what other good kids' movies are coming out? So I really think that that could have extremely long legs and those... Those minions. I love the minions. Kids love minions. <laughs> Number one, I'm saying Guardians. It had a huge opening, and I think it's going to stay up there. Mark, what's the top five? You know, I haven't heard the words 47 meters come out of any of y'all's mouth. <laughs> look out, Mandy Moore. Um, at number five, I am going to have Wonder Woman getting into the top five, just edging out movies like Pirates of the Caribbean and Cars 3. So number five, I have Wonder Woman. Number four, I have Transformers, Edge of the Last Extinction. At number three, <laughs> I'm going to have Despicable Me Three, I think the only movies that cannot get over the hurdle of is the Marvel properties, whether it's actually Marvel Studios or Sony. Because at number two, I have Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. And at number one, I have Spider-Man Homecoming. All right. And now for your definitive true answer, the top five of the box (laughs) office this summer are going to be, despite the fact that I said Pirates will definitely be in the top five, I don't have it in my top five, <laughs> as it turns out. Uh, at number five, I think Wonder Woman sneaks in. I think Wonder Woman mm-hmm. sneaks in in the top five. I think at number four, Transformers. It's just, it's the brand, and it's a big spectacle movie. I think it's going to nudge it up into the top four spot. I think Guardians of the Galaxy 2 is going to hit the number three spot. I, just because I just don't think it's... I just don't even think it's as close to as good as the first one was. I enjoyed it. I like Guardians of the Galaxy 2. I give it a positive review. But it, I don't think it's going to get the repeat business that the first Guardians did, per se. At number two, I got Despicable Me 3. I think this is what this is going to be surprising a lot of people. I think it's going to make a hell of a lot of money. And then I agree with most of you guys. Um, so you, Spider-Man Homecoming. So you gonna, didn't have Mummy in there either. And I also did not have Mummy in there. <laughs> I believe there were seven films I guaranteed would be in the top five. Uh, so again, the, the, for me, that's going to be Wonder Woman at five, Transformers at four, Guardians of the Galaxy at three, Despicable Me 3 at number two, and Spider-Man Homecoming at number one. Now... Of course, the real important thing is, what do you guys think? Jump into our comments section and give us what do you think will be the top five finishers of the domestic box office for the summer movies of 2017. All right, guys, we still have some time here, so we're going to get to some mailbag questions. Don't forget, we're also going to take some live Twitter questions in a couple of minutes. Follow us on Twitter, at Collider Video, and start sending in some questions right now, and Wendy will pick a couple out. But let's take a couple of mailbag questions first here. Ashley, what's in the mailbag? Andrew writes, greetings and salutations, Movie Talk crew. I've recently gotten into a debate with some people about Spider-Man Homecoming and Spider-Man's film rights. I say that Sony still owns Spider-Man's film rights and that Marvel Studios are on board as creative producers on the film. They disagree. Who has the final say for Spider-Man Homecoming, Sony or Marvel Studios? Thank you for clearing this up. Cheers. Okay, there is there is the actual real answer, and then there's the day-to-day practical answer. The day-to-day practical answer is that Sony, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies, is giving Marvel a lot of creative freedom to do what they want to do. The real literal uh, answer is, who has the final, like the absolute final veto on anything? It's Sony Pictures. They have the final veto on something. There's nothing Marvel can do in, the, in like, say, Spider-Man Homecoming that Sony does not approve. Now, I think in the practical day-to-day, they give them freedom to do what, what they want to do. Yes, 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 and they approve on the most stuff. But I've got a friend of mine who's actually been working on this picture, and they say this, this, this gets me really excited. They say this movie really has ended up being a really good mix between Sony's input and Marvel's input. And they say they think the movie has turned out better than just if Sony had done it and just if if Marvel had done it. Marvel wanted to go really heavy in one direction. Sony initially wanted to go really further in another direction. And they tell me, at least anyway, that this the final product is going to be a really nice amalgamation between the two. And they think the the audiences are going to love this movie. Now, we'll see if that actually turns out to be true. But when it comes down to the final 
veto on things, you're absolutely right. Sony still owns the rights. They have an agreement with Marvel to do these things, but at the end of the day, so Spider-Man in the movie world is still their character. Anyway, do you guys have anything you want to add to that? I, I got an analogy that Andrew can use with his friends. Okay, so it's like Sony owns the baseball stadium, right? But Marvel are the umpires who rule whether the ball is fair or foul. <laughs> Come on, that's awesome. It's, it's an interesting analogy. That makes perfect sense. Now, I was with you with your joke earlier. I'm not I'm not on board with the, you. Canadians. You know. Okay, it's like if they own the hockey arena. <laughs> and then the umps with the referees will rule whether it was actually a goal or not. You know, here's here's a better sports analogy. Here's a better sports analogy. Oh, for okay. two. The, there's a football team, all right? Yeah. You have the owner of the team and you have the coach of the team. The coach calls all the plays. The owner does have the right to come down and say, hey, I don't like what you're doing. Uh, stop it or you're out. Yeah, but see, for the I, most part, you I, let the coach call the plays. I, I, I like mine better. <laughs> all right. Mine wasn't all that strong either, admittedly. Well, I, I think mine was more Marvel. Yours was more Sony. Christian, give us a better analogy. Well, I'd love to move on. <laughs> <laughs> all right. What's next? What's the next question? Oh, man. Okay. Oh, all right. Hey, Collider. My question is about the upcoming Dark Tower movie. In the book series, Stephen King draws upon lots of characters and settings from his previous books. The preacher from Salem's Lot, the demon slash clown from it, Rick Flagg slash man in black from The Stand, to name a few. Almost all of the books that King wrote are interconnected to the Dark Tower in some way albeit minor way, are the mar the makers of the upcoming Dark Tower and It movies missing an opportunity by not connecting them? Can they even be at this point? Thanks. No, they're not missing an opportunity by, by not connecting them in any way. And, and here's the other thing. We got a very similar question to this on our weekend mailbag show Josh and I took uh, either last week or two weeks ago. And I kind of chuckled at it a little bit. And people's, people got mad at me. They said, you clearly don't understand that there are some crossover characters in the books. No, 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 I get that. But the bottom line to this is, like it and Dark Tower are being made by two completely different studios that are not working together on like say a Sony Marvel situation. They're not working together. It's made by different studios. The different film rights are owned to the different titles. It's not like Stephen King sold his film rights all to one studio for all of his properties. So no, you're not gonna see this as a crossover thing. Like, hey, maybe one of the studios will create a crossover thing within their own, within the, the, the properties they have the rights to, but no, generally speaking, you're not going to see a big, massive, interconnected Stephen King universe tied stuff. Nah, I don't think so. And I think that what we were just talking about with the uh, box office is that we hope that this movie does well. It's not It's not like a Marvel movie where you know that you have a pretty good bet that it's going to do very well. And you, then you start connecting things because they weren't just talking. They wanted to connect Iron Man to stuff. Sure. But, it, but they were hoping. And I think it's the same thing because the other... Remember how long and how, how tough it was to get... The Dark Tower made in the first place with Ron Howard's involvement and, and like, was it going to be a TV series? It went through so many different tries. To, it was that hard to make a standalone movie alone. Now, take that and put it times 100 trying to connect all these other things. It doesn't need to happen and it won't happen. Yeah, Harry. just the fact that they're owned by two different studios makes this completely impossible. But if you go and you watch the Dark Tower trailer, they do put little Easter eggs. So clearly they're able to do stuff like that, which I think is important given the way that Stephen King writes. But we also have that Castle Rock show coming up. So if that's something you're really interested in, we are getting it just in a different form somewhere else. All right, so the Dark Tower is like a basketball arena, right? <laughs> and then other Stephen King properties are other arenas that do not interconnect at all. If there was going to be one crossover, one shared universe movie with the Dark Tower, I think you could could put the character of Rick Flagg in something like The Stand if they wanted to get that off the ground again in a cinematic way. I don't see that happening, but it would be hilarious if like every five minutes in the Dark Tower, you have another Stephen King character show up. Like there's like a there's like a bunch of dead kittens that come up at one point. There's a mod that makes out with the sun like sleepwalkers. Kathy Bates shows up from Misery. Tom Hanks from The Green Mile. Four kids from Stand By Me. They go look for a dead body. We could have a lot of fun with the Dark Tower movies, John. All right, guys. Well, I said we'd save a little bit of time at the end of the show for your Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. So, Wendy, what have you picked out? This one comes from Last Rob, and he writes, Do you see Hollywood having a complete shutdown now that the actors are making demands? No, no, I, I don't. I, I, and really, I, I don't think the. Uh, I, I mean, I've read some things too, but it's. I'm, I don't think it's really as serious as as some people think it is. I don't really think it's going to lead to anything. No, the Harbingers right now are not as uh, gloomy as what it could have been during the writer's strike. But I mean, yeah. hopefully, all these situations get resolved. But I don't think it's as dire a situation as what we had a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Well, I agree. Where Hollywood or any industry gets concerned is not really over one single union. 
where Hollywood especially gets concerned is when the unions start to join up. So like what could have turned into a terrible situation is if the writers thing, and remember the writers and, and the producers have come to an agreement, they mm -hmm. have an agreement now, but if they didn't and the writers decided they were going to go on strike, then the big fear becomes other unions, whether it's the you know D Directors Guild or whether it's the uh, the SAG right. or whether it's whatever that they decide they're going to join with them. That's it's kind of like a World War One scenario where you know Duke Ferdinand suddenly that starts a whole bunch of falling dominoes. That was the worry, but now that the writers thing, now that they have a deal, I think it really protects anything from. Oh, I'll keep running with it because World War One started in 1914. The United States not get involved until a few years later. So the fear is if the actors aren't happy with the current deal, then SAG takes a step back. But the next time the writer's strike comes on the table, which is going to be in a couple years, Three years, because that's what they, they, they just got a deferment to solve other issues. So then if you have the Director's Guild or the Screen Actors Guild and they're all like, OK, we're going to wait, then they all are lying in the weeds and they unite together in three years. That's when you have your World War One. Yeah, that could be that could be very bad. Yeah. But as of for, for today, everything's fine. All right, what's next? The next one comes from Ben Burnside, who writes, what is your favorite movie-themed ride in a theme park? Good question. Good question. Um, you know, I don't actually like the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. Uh, oh, so that it makes it easy. The Indiana Jones ride at Disneyland. I can, I can ride that five times a day, I and especially since they've updated it about a year ago. It's, it's an amazing thrill ride. It really ties in with the movies. If you feel like you're a part of one of Indy's adventures, I love that ride. Huh. I like all rides, so it's hard to choose. I think I'm going to cheat a little and say when we went to uh, Hollywood Studios for Star Wars Celebration right. and they turned the Aerosmith ride, the roller coaster in there, into a Star Wars theme version where they weren't playing Aerosmith, but they were playing the Star Wars theme song and the whole thing was black and there were stars everywhere. That'll be my favorite right now. Ooh, Aerosmith versus John Williams. That is a tough call. <laughs> I like when they turn Space Mountain into Hyperspace Mountain. If mm -hmm. I'm taking Star Wars off the table, then I can still consider Splash Mountain kind of a movie-themed ride. So because I enjoy getting wet on rides a little more so than I enjoy seeing giant snakes. Stop <laughs> Ashley, laughing, Ashley. Uh -oh. I'm going to go with Splash Mountain ever so slightly over the, the uh, Indiana Jones ride. Yeah, I would also go this. You have to talk about Song of the South, right? Yeah, it's not a great movie, and it doesn't hold up. It doesn't necessarily stand the test of time all that but, well, but, but the I, ride's fun. It, it is. The movie itself, yeah, is from, from the time, it's very dated and a lot of... Horrific things. movie, don't watch it, kids. Well, I, <laughs> the, the, the Br'er Rabbit himself is still He's all cool. right. Br'er yeah. Rabbit, and, and that's what the focus of the ride <laughs> right. is, not the other nonsense. But, uh, but that particular <laughs> ride, for sure. I used to say Back to the Future. Um, yeah, but the, Universal Studios. And it's yeah. the same problem I have with Star Tours, too. I, I loved it when I went and I saw it, too. I, I get sick of these stupid things now. I just can't do no, it. No, you don't. Really? I do. I can't. I can't it's, you can't control yourself. Uh, I, when, I wa when I watch it, I'm like, I'm in it, and I'm loving every bit about it. But I go out, and I got to either I gotta eat something right afterwards. Which is exactly what you did at Star Wars Celebration. I did. <laughs> I, did. I ran, and I got the food right afterwards. And you and didn't come on the Toy Story ride with us. Well, you missed yeah. out. Well, you guys are, you know, you're rotten. The best <laughs> ride based on a TV show, The Twilight Zone. And I'm so bummed they took mm. The Twilight Zone out for The Guardians. I'm sure The Guardians ride is going to be fun, and it's going to be as good as The Twilight Zone. Who are you? All right, what's next? Um, all right. I can't believe any, no, nobody mentioned Harry Potter. Never been. Or oh, yeah, I haven't been on it yet. Ride. I've been to Harry Potter Land, but I've, I've not, not been, been on that ride yet. Oh. <sighs> You know what you I heard? You live so right next door to it. <laughs> well, Christian, that's not a ride for you because I don't get nauseous or dizzy Harry on Potter? a ride. The first You'll time I ever on it. rode the Harry Potter ride in Orlando, not here. A whole bunch of people, right, when we got let Puking. off the car, they didn't puke, but a bunch of people went and, like, put their heads between their legs and were definitely really... Because they're really just, my, my favorite thing about... <laughs> sorry, just, just an unrelated story. That, that, I, you know, because John Roker works at the Harry Potter thing, too, <laughs> and I was listening to him on a show, and apparently people were walking up to him, because you got to stay in character as Wendy, because you got to stay, or you get fired, and people are walking up to him as he's like, hello, everyone, and they're like, the outlaw! And he's like, tell me about it. he's like... I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you see him? Go up to him and scream out loud at him, please. I'm going to do that next get time him in in trouble. Trouble. Oh, I want to see how I, get him I want to see how committed of an actor he is. All right, what's next? I'm going to go next time. I'm going to Snapchat him. All right, the next one comes <laughs> from Ginger about? Ninja, who writes, nice. What are your thoughts on Taika Waititi? Heed the signs, hashtag Ragnarok post on Twitter. Who's will Natalie you? Portman be coming back to play Jane Foster? Thanks. All right, we well, we don't have uh, we don't have the picture ready for you guys, but if you guys look up the tweet, if you just go and, and follow Taika Waititi's uh, Twitter, he's got 
pictures of two actresses, uh, one of which is... Uh, uh, Natalie Portman, too. Uh, but, uh, Natalie Portman. That's her, too. No, it's not. Yes, it's from The Professional, isn't it? No, 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 no. That's, I, I, that's, the, yeah. that's the girl... The one on oh, the left. That's Natalie Portman from The Professional. Yeah. Are you, no, th- I'm almost positive. Is that's, that not the girl... No, that's Natalie Portman. Who, ...from uh, Westworld, who is also in Thor Ragnarok? No, that's Natalie Portman from oh, The Professional. Okay, I thought it was ah. the girl from Westworld. That's okay. why they have them side by side. Okay, so uh, there's two things to, to note. One is that it's Natalie Portman in the picture... Two, they're carrying what looks like a Groot kind of uh, plant in their arms. So does that mean, A, Natalie Portman is coming back? Um, Dear God, I hope not. I'm a huge fan of Natalie Portman. But it, it, her and Jennifer Lawrence just kind of took the same thing. She kind of phoned it in. They didn't even really want to be there. And the love interest between Thor and, and Jane was rotten and terrible. One of the worst things about this franchise. So I hope not. The Groot thing I'm intrigued by. Because remember, not too long ago, Vin Diesel said, I remember, the, the people want to see the Hulk fight Groot. There's there's an there's an opportunity there. It would be really fun. I'll jump out of my seat if I see Groot pop up in the arena. I'll take good? Groot in anything. I mean, I'm much more interested in the bromance between Thor and Hulk than I am in the romance between Thor and Jane Foster. But I would welcome Natalie Portman back to the movie in a small role that's not too integral to the plot going forward. It'd be good to see her again. If it's a breakup scene, then I'm all for it. <laughs> If it's like strictly <laughs> so that we can see them break up so Thor can move on, then I'm all for it. I feel it. like Groot is now going to be the worst way for rumors to start. It's like, forget the fact that she's holding a plant. If there's a tree in a movie, Groot is in it. I mean, this this it doesn't seem completely out of the realm of possibility that Groot might pop up one way or the other, but this is just like a black hole of rumorness. Maybe she's an assassin. That's all I got. Ah, okay, there you go. All right, guys, that'll do it for this installment of the Movie Talk. Thanks so much for joining us. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, over there, Mr. Mark Ellis. Where can people find you online? Uh, you know, John, you could probably find me at your local watering hole. If not, you can check out at Mark Ellis Live <laughs> or for upcoming tour dates, MarkEllisLive.com. I'm at the Comedy Store this Friday, and you can find me and this young man on the Movie Trivia Schmodown calling it. I was pointing at Christian, not Perry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, there you go. Well, fine. I'll go. Jeremy Johns <laughs> and Robert Meyer Burnett are going one on one in an inner geekdom showdown tomorrow. Go ahead, support both those guys. It's going to be a lot of fun. Sitting right beside me, the young man Perry Nemiroff. <laughs> what do you think? Where do you find you, Perry? She's an engaged this, woman, John. Yeah, Stop really. It. I'm an engaged pregnant. woman with a baby. Not absolutely not. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> you can find pictures of none of those things on Twitter and Instagram <laughs> at pnemiroff. And please watch Glider Behind the Scenes this Saturday, 2 p.m. PST. Uh, the recently uh, broken up and now single again. Oh, oh, yeah. Ashley Mova, where can you find you online? Oh, no. You guys can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Ashley Mova. Happy Thursday, guys. And of course, Wendy Lee. This just in, Ashley Mova is now engaged again. <laughs> oh, you can find yeah. me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and at Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. And you guys can simply follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube, wherever. Just at John Campy. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. And until next time, bye bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.